Hey, we landed on the moon. We sailed around the world. Romeo met Juliet. Hey, it's hard to imagine that there are creatures out there who saw it all happen. Immortal animals. Well, almost. Glass sponges are weird little creatures that sit in one place for thousands of years. From their favorite spot under the sea, they witnessed the first Europeans crossing over to the Americas. They can live up to 15,000 years. And what's even cooler is that they can control their aging process, speed it up or slow it down. They have a glass-like exoskeleton for protection. Lobsters can grow back a limb if they lose it, and they're basically immortal. They produce an unlimited number of enzymes that keeps their DNA young forever. And they just keep on growing. That means they outgrow their own shells. They have to shed their exoskeleton every now and then and upgrade to a bigger one. The largest lobster ever caught was 44 pounds off the coast of Nova Scotia. Scientists think this large lobster was around 100 years old. It was around when Edison invented the phonograph. This next creature is a mix between a jellyfish and a tree branch. Each end of the hydra has a ringed foot, and it spends its days chilling by lakes and rivers. Its tentacles grab onto tasty snacks that swim past it. So, what's the secret to its immortality? That's something everyone wants to know. The hydra has the ability to renew its stem cells. Scientists have been trying to do that for years. They can actually slow down their aging process. Now, these little sea creatures are red sea urchins. They sit on seaweed in shallow waters and are immortal. Well, we haven't been studying them long enough to know for sure. But scientists say they only grow in size, not in age. What? Well, they sort of stay like little baby urchins, but grow in size. Adult, baby urchin, okay. These little babies can reach around 100 years old, even 200. The slowest on the list? The giant tortoise. It can reach 200 years old. And one of the oldest is Jonathan. He's technically the oldest crawling land animal. He was born in 1832 and lives it up on a remote island called St. Helena. Jonathan's been through a lot. He's seen the very first American skyscraper, the Eiffel Tower. Oh yeah, he's also lived through every single World Series, starting when he was 71 years old. Now, he can't see too well, and he's lost his sense of smell, but he's still going strong. Back to the oceans and the Greenland shark. It's been known to be the longest living vertebrate and can live more than 400 years. Swimming around for that long in the deep, dark, cold ocean means these sharks are tough. They're able to withstand insane water pressure. Sharks are one of the only creatures today that haven't been affected too much by evolution. Many sharks have been around since the dinosaurs and haven't changed much. Scientists found out that they grow around a half an inch per year. So, with a little bit of quick math, they can easily find out the age of these tough sharks. Imagine seeing a shark that's older than the USA. This next creature is probably the most durable, indestructible, and cutest on the list. It's called a tardigrade, but scientists nickname it water bear because I guess it looks like one. But it's not exactly bear size. It has eight legs and hands with a strange little nose. And these bizarre microscopic creatures are indestructible. They're known to live in the most extreme places on the planet. They're fine with temperatures as high as 300 and as low as minus 330. Volcanoes, frozen desert nights, they can even handle radiation and massive amounts of pressure in the deepest parts of the ocean. They can even survive the vacuum in space. No tiny little spacesuit or anything. Yeah, that would be cute enough. So far, they've survived 10 days on the outside of a spaceship, but they could probably do longer. Tardigrades might be able to outlive humans if there's some sort of worldwide catastrophe. Microscopic organisms in charge of the planet. Hmm, wonder what that would look like. Whether it's all the volcanoes erupting at once, or another ice age, or even another pesky asteroid. Tardigrades probably wouldn't even notice. Scientists are studying them to see if they can help us with some next-level biotech. Now, just for fun, here's the mayfly. 
this poor little insect doesn't even make it past 24 hours on average. Females and males can make it to a whopping two days old. Talk about living in the moment. These little flies grow in swarms and are known to have one of the shortest lifespans of any creature. But as a species? Well, they've been around for hundreds of millions of years. Jellyfish have discovered the fountain of youth, and surprise, surprise, it's been inside them all along. Not inspirational poster style, but literally, it's always been inside them. Jellyfish are able to reverse their aging process whenever they want. Imagine you're swimming along and then you think to yourself, gee, I kind of want to be 8 again. And poof, there you are. Who wouldn't want to go back to being 8? That's how jellyfish stay young and live stress-free. These brainless and boneless creatures can turn the clock back anytime they want, as long as no one bothers them. They're super chill, just floating in whatever direction the current takes them. Like, uh, go with the flow? This creature looks like something right out of a sci-fi movie, and you could say it has sort of alien features. The giant Weta outweighs a mouse and is considered one of the biggest insects out there. You find these big bugs in New Zealand. While jellyfish can reverse their aging process, some members of the Weta family can come back to life. Talk about superpowers! If they get completely frozen, they start to make special proteins that stop their organs from getting ruined. After whatever amount of time they're frozen, they can be thawed out and brought back to life, like nothing ever happened. In fact, the giant Weta has ears on its knees in its front legs. And because it can resurrect, it's also called the zombie bug. <laughs> Planaria are flatworms that are unique. Apart from being practically immortal, they're the ultimate regeneration machines for lost body parts. If you take one of them and divide its body into 10 parts, you'll end up with 10 new planaria. You keep dividing them up, they'll keep multiplying, even though they're usually less than an inch long. Imagine if we could figure out how to do that. Would that be a way for us to live forever? Or would we end up with a totally crazy world with copies of everyone walking around? How about the world's fastest relay team? Four identical Usain Bolts. Now, clams have been around for a really long time. Scientists have discovered that they can live up to 400 years old. These little shelled creatures are the ones that create those shiny little pearls everyone loves. A clam will go into action mode when a parasite gets inside. The clam tries to cover the parasite with a bunch of special chemicals, the same ones it uses to make the inside of its shell. That's when the magic starts to happen. When these chemicals harden up, they make a shiny, glossy pearl. The more chemicals, the bigger the pearl. Now, this long, slippery-looking creature lives deep in the caves of Europe. Ohm can live up to be 100 years old. It spends its days hunting for little insects, snails, and crabs with its tiny front arms and wriggling, snake-like body. Its skin is so pale that some locals even call it the human fish. Hey, wait a minute! The ohm is almost blind, but it can still detect light. It just mostly does it through its skin. Like other blind animals, it has a supercharged sense of hearing and smell. It gets its distinct look from those little red gills around its neck. All aboard! This is the Intergalactic Cruiser. The destination on your ticket is a tour of the local group of galaxies. Featuring the large and small Magellanic galaxies, the Orion Nebula, the Andromeda and Triangulum galaxies, and a few surprises in between. Tickets, please! Be advised you may experience a slight tingling sensation as we rev into hyperspace. The ship and everything in it is going through a dimensional phase change. It's nothing to worry about. The tingling passes quickly. Now, passengers, as we head toward galactic latitude 180 degrees north, as terrarians are accustomed to calling it, our first main item of interest will be an intense star-forming region known as M42, the Orion Nebula. But first, a special treat by the captain that's not on the advertised itinerary. The Horsehead Nebula! It's off to the port side, that's left for you Aggies. Its designation is M43. The newborn star at the top of the horse's head has a strong solar wind that is deforming the shape of the nebular cloud. 
get a good look at it now, because in a few thousand years, those gases will be completely blown away by the star-like nebula that made our sun. Yep, long gone, except for the nebular gases captured by Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Okay now, one of our junior explorers asks a question. What is the M in M42 and M43? Well, young lady, the M stands for Messier. Pronounce Messier, not Messier, as in, is your room messier than mine? <laughs> Charles Messier, I mean Messier to be precise, was a French astronomer in the 18th century. He published a catalog of 110 fuzzy objects as seen through an early telescope. The Horsehead Nebula is number 43 on his list. We'll see more M's as we continue our tour. Heads up, we're coming to the Orion Nebula. The gases in the nebula may seem less colorful than you expect. That's because we're accustomed to seeing long-exposure telescopic photos and enhanced photos designed to highlight the different gases in the nebula. May I suggest using the pair of tinted glasses that come with your onboarding packet if you want to heighten your experience. In we go! Now, it's a good thing we are in hyperspace. As we approach the trapezium star cluster in the center, the bright star, Theta C, sends out a solar wind at 5 million miles an hour. It sculpts the whole cloud of gas and dust, creating shock waves that compress nearby stars. Theta C is a megastar, 200,000 times brighter than the sun. It will go supernova in about a million years. I won't be around then. Oxygen, hydrogen, and sulfur glow in ionized states like a fluorescent light bulb. Oxygen blue, hydrogen red, some green and sulfur, and dust glow as yellow-orange. As we pull out of the Orion Nebula and rise high above the galactic plane, the spiral arms of the Milky Way are visible. Our Sun, which you cannot distinguish from this height above the galaxy, is in the Orion Spur that lies between the outer Perseus arm and the inner Sagittarius arm. Notice the center of the Milky Way contains a bright magnetic bar that plays an essential part in star formation. Over 70% of nearby galaxies include magnetic bars. It's a sign of a mature galaxy. Only 20% of distant galaxies contain magnetic bars in their cores. Which reminds me, passengers, the juice bar is now open. Our H1 server will take your orders. Now, that's the Andromeda galaxy far, far out to the port side. But may I call your attention to the many dwarf galaxies, over 40 of them, that populate our galactic neighborhood. We're heading to one now. The Large Magellanic Cloud, LMC to astronomers, is an irregular dwarf satellite galaxy of the Milky Way, containing about 30 billion stars with a dynamic star-forming region called the Tarantula Nebula, which we will be cruising through shortly. Of course, if there is a Large Magellanic Cloud, there must be a Small Magellanic Cloud, SMC. And there it is, below and to the left of the LMC. The Milky Way will eventually ingest both dwarf galaxies. Some prefer the word accreted, but the result is the same. If you use your tinted glasses again, you can see that the LMC has stripped away a tremendous amount of gas from the SMC, as they have interacted gravitationally over millions of years. Hey, I know all about gas! Now we're heading out of the Milky Way to a distance of about 50 kiloparsecs. That's 50,000 parsecs, or about 163,000 light years. So, what's a parsec? No, it's not slang for pair of socks. A parsec is about 3.26 light years. A light year is about 5.88 trillion miles. The word parsec is a combination of two words, parallax and second. Parallax is the shift an object seems to make when viewed from two different perspectives. Looking at an object with your left eye and then your right eye, you'll see the object appear to shift. That's parallax. When an astronomical object is photographed with the Earth on one side of the Sun and then again six months later on the other side of the Sun, the shift is measurable in degrees of arc or minutes of arc or seconds of arc down to milliseconds of arc. That's a parsec, a parallax of one arc second, which turns out to be 3.26 light years. Hey, what about a Joan of Arc? That's how you measure distances in France. Ha <laughs> ha! 
Meanwhile, since you can't measure a light year with a ruler or a tape measure, parsecs are the scientific way of telling the distance to a star or intergalactic object. The greater the parallax, the closer the object is. The smaller the parallax, the farther away it is. Now, straight ahead in the heart of the Tarantula Nebula is the R136 star cluster. Within a distance of one light year, there are over 40 stars each with a mass over 50 times that of the Sun. Wow! Comparatively, there isn't a single other star within four light years of our home star, Sol. And that's a good thing. You can see Supernova 1987A at about 2 o'clock high. A blue giant star, 100,000 times brighter than the Sun, experienced a core implosion, resulting in a Type II supernova 100 million times brighter than the Sun. It has left behind a neutron star, clouded in dust and gas, and a wildly spectacular display of fireworks. Now, 1987A in the Large Magellanic Cloud is the closest supernova to Earth since 1604, which happened in the Milky Way about 20,000 light years from Earth. It was visible in the daytime for about two weeks, or so. After 1987A went supernova because it was a blue giant star, Speculation has increased that the blue giant star Rigel, the foot star of the constellation Orion, might go supernova in the not-too-distant future, or already has gone supernova. Rigel is approximately 860 light-years from Earth, so anything that happens to Rigel would take about 860 years before it would be noticed on Earth. Supernova 1987A ejected the heavy elements, like cobalt, nickel, and iron, and lighter silicates into the Tarantula Nebula, where they will form the basic building blocks of stars and planets. Our server is now offering space-themed snacks. May I recommend the Jupiter Cotton Candy Puffs for the children on board? Aww. Remember, I know all about gas. Our next stop is the Andromeda Galaxy and Environs. Notice its halo as we leave the Milky Way and its 300 billion stars behind. As many as 150 globular clusters reside in the galactic halo. They orbit down and through the galactic disk and contain some of the oldest stars in the universe. How they got here in our home galaxy is a matter of intense study. You will notice NGC 6822, an irregular dwarf galaxy off to the starboard. NGC stands for New General Catalog of Astronomical Objects. Now you'd think there'd have been an old general catalog, but there wasn't. It was just a new catalog. There is, however, a revised new general catalog which astronomers refer to regularly. Clears that up, huh? As we pass NGC 6822, you'll notice a magnetic bar beginning to form and bright patches of new star formation. This galaxy was discovered in 1884 by E.E. E. Barnard, and is also called Barnard's Galaxy. Mr. Barnard was quite an astronomical observer. He has a crater on the moon named for him, one on Mars, an area on Jupiter's moon Ganymede, a minor planet, number 819 Bernardania, and the star with the fastest movement across the sky, Bernard Star. Now, not too many people have their name emblazoned across space, as has Edward Emerson Bernard. Approaching the giant Andromeda galaxy with its trillion stars, we will skirt above its western edge and visit one of the enormous galaxy's dwarf companion galaxies, M110 or NGC 205. Yes, it also has two designations. Hey, take your pick. The first of its kind, a dwarf spheroidal galaxy of about 3.5 billion solar masses, M110 or NGC 205 if you wish, has eight globular clusters near its core. It too will be swallowed, or accreted if you prefer, by the Andromeda galaxy. It may have already been stripped of much of its stars and gas, a point highlighted by M110's general lack of star formation. Everybody having fun yet? And now our final stop, M33, the Triangulum Galaxy, the third and last spiral galaxy of our local group. Located in the small constellation of Triangulum, Latin for triangle, good guess, 
M33 is about half the size of the Milky Way. The Triangulum Galaxy is 2.7 million light years from Earth, but it is much closer to the Andromeda Galaxy and moving towards it. If two spiral galaxies collide, it may alter the course of the Andromeda Galaxy and prevent the predicted collision with the Milky Way. Well, let's hope so. Now, this important message. We will serve dinner on our return trip to Earth. There's a choice of chicken or fish. We hope you have enjoyed the tour. Hey, if you fill out our survey and give us five stars, you can also have dessert. They say, somewhere out there, there's a pen that can work in zero gravity, at extreme temperatures, and even underwater. They say this pen can write on almost any surface, or if you turn it upside down, or when your surroundings are heated up to 570 degrees Fahrenheit. They say NASA spent millions, or probably billions of dollars, and almost a decade to develop such a pen. The problem with ballpoint pens in space is that they don't work in the conditions of weightlessness. The ink can't flow to the ball normally, since gravity doesn't affect it. Instead, pressure is created in the ink reservoir, and pens start leaking. Some time ago, NASA used pencils, but wooden pencils were considered to be a fire hazard in most spaceships. All because, at that time, the atmosphere inside them was 100% oxygen. The need for a super pen was obvious. But whatever the rumors claim, NASA did not create such a pen, spending a fortune on the research. Its development was sponsored by Paul C. Fisher of the Fisher Pen Company based in Chicago. He spent over $1 million in almost 10 years to make a pressurized ink cartridge. It was supposed to allow space pens to function in zero gravity and other extreme conditions. Eventually, they got a pen that could write at a temperature of minus 30 to 250 degrees Fahrenheit, which is really impressive, isn't it? The pen was patented in 1966, and one year later, after conducting several thorough tests, NASA started to provide Apollo astronauts with such pens. Interestingly, the rumors about NASA spending an insane amount of money on the development of space pens have been circulating for decades. They have been debunked many times, but they appear again and again. Many sci-fi movies can make you believe that everything happening in space is accompanied by some kind of a sound effect, which is a totally false misconception. In space, no one will hear you scream. You know why? There's no air in space. It's an almost perfect vacuum. And sound waves don't travel through a vacuum. They can't reach your eardrums and make them vibrate, sending signals to your brain. But it's a good thing, especially for astronauts on spacewalks. If not for the quietness of space, they would be constantly overwhelmed by the noise of solar storms. Here's another one. All comets have beautiful long tails. It's nothing but a popular misconception. In reality, comets are very difficult space bodies to spot. They usually spend large amounts of time far away from stars. There, in the darkness of space, they remain rather inactive and completely frozen. Comets only get tails once they come close to a star. That's when they start warming up. This process makes them form some kind of a cloudy atmosphere, which is called a coma, and a distinctive tail. The tail always points away from the star that influences the comet. It happens because the tail gets blown in the opposite direction by solar radiation and solar winds. That's why the tail can often be in front of the comet, not trailing after it. Now, let's look at a light year. This very notion makes us believe we speak about time here. But in reality, light years measure distance. NASA's definition of a light year goes like this. The total distance that a beam of light moving in a straight line travels in a year. And since light moves at a speed of 186,000 miles per second, a light year equals almost 6 trillion miles. Hey, do the math! Now people often believe that in space, you experience zero gravity. Hence the weightlessness astronauts feel on the International Space Station. But that's not exactly true. Gravity is one of the most important forces that exist in the universe. Thanks to it, the Moon can orbit Earth, and the Sun doesn't float away from our home Milky Way galaxy. But the astronauts on the ISS experience not full-fledged, but microgravity, which means very small gravity. The gravity on the space station is only 10% weaker than the gravity on Earth's surface. But astronauts are constantly in freefall. 
The spacecraft, the people inside, and all the objects aboard keep falling forward, not down, but around our planet, following a specific orbit. And since they're all falling together, the crew and the stuff inside seem to be floating. That's why astronauts can move things as heavy as hundreds of pounds with their fingertips. And even though microgravity is often called zero gravity, they're very different things. Now, it may seem as if the sun is always on fire. At least, that's what it looks like in pictures. But in reality, our star is a giant ball of gas. Hey, I can relate. Nuclear reactions happening in its core at all times makes the sun burn. Every second, hundreds of millions of tons of hydrogen are converted into almost as much helium. During this process, huge amounts of energy are released as gamma rays. Then these rays turn into light. In other words, the sun does emit blinding light and incredible heat. But it's not actually on fire, because no oxygen is involved in the process. A human can explode if they get into open space without a spacesuit. Well, contrary to popular belief, taking off a spacesuit during a spacewalk won't be as dramatic as it's often pictured in movies. A person will lose consciousness due to a lack of oxygen after 15 seconds of being in outer space without protection. Before it happens, the person should breathe out as much air as possible. Otherwise, this oxygen will damage their lungs from the inside. Then, without the protection of the spacesuit, which is like a mini spaceship, the pressure inside their body will drop. This will cause even more serious troubles. And even though this person definitely won't burst, they won't want to stay outside for too long. Black holes are giant, scary cosmic vacuum cleaners, they say. But in reality, black holes are more like fly traps. They don't look for things to munch on. Instead, they sit out there quite passively. Only when a star comes too close does a black hole spring into action. Even so, only those space objects that cross a certain border get ripped apart. If the Sun were suddenly replaced with a black hole, Earth's orbit wouldn't change. At the same time, Earth's temperature would be different. There would be no solar wind, and no magnetic storms created by the Sun would affect our planet. And let's say the black hole that replaced the Sun had the same mass as our star. Then, according to the law of physics, Earth would have to come very close to get pulled into this black hole. Now, the dark side of the Moon myth was debunked more than 50 years ago. And still, not everyone knows that this dark side is simply part of the Earth's natural satellite that faces away from our planet. By no means is it darker than any other region of the Moon, and sunlight falls equally on all sides of the satellite. It only seems dark because we never see this side of the Moon from Earth, all because of the phenomenon known as tidal locking. Over billions of years, ooh, let me say that again, billions of years, the gravitational connection between our planet and its natural satellite has changed their orbits. The speed at which they move has also become different. And since Earth is way bigger than the Moon, the satellite's rotation was gradually slowing down. Until at one point, it reached the point of balance. And now, it takes the Moon the same time to make a full rotation around its axis and a fully orbit around Earth. Now, you might have heard people referring to Venus as Earth's twin. It's true that both these planets are of almost the same size. They have similar mass and composition. The surface gravity on Venus is 91% of that on Earth. So, if your weight was 100 pounds on our planet, on Venus, you'd weigh 91 pounds. And still, calling these planets twins is a step too far. The atmosphere on Venus is 100 times thicker than that on Earth. Plus, its surface temperatures are insanely high, up to 850 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hot enough to melt lead or burn up your pizza. Venus has no water oceans or any life forms. It also rotates backward compared to all other planets of the solar system, including Earth. By the way, another myth claims that Mercury is the hottest planet in the solar system. After all, it's the closest planet to the Sun, but Venus is actually hotter. Asteroids strike Earth much more often than people tend to believe. But most of these collisions aren't history-changing extinction events. Most of them go completely unnoticed. Most asteroids that approach our planet are qualified as small, near-Earth objects. They usually burn up in Earth's atmosphere before they even have a chance to wipe out life off the surface of the planet. Not that they're big enough to do that. And still, around 40 to 80 tons of space debris fall on Earth every year. 
Most of this debris is tiny asteroids, also called bolides. They're usually no larger than 65 feet in diameter. Um, that's small? Yeah, says so right here. Okay. Did you know that humans are real space people? You were born in space. Heck, even I was born in space. We were all born in space. But for humans to be here on Earth, so many conditions have to be precisely correct that it's highly improbable that we even exist. But we do. First, we, and any other space creatures who might be out there, have to live on a planet orbiting a yellowish-white star. Not a red star or a blue star. Not a blue star, because they burn out too quickly. In a few million years, there wouldn't be time for evolution to do its relatively slow magic and produce intelligent beings. Blue stars also tend to swell up and turn red when they collapse and explode. It makes it highly unlikely that any civilization could prosper near a blue star. Red stars, which are by far the most numerous kind of stars, don't seem like good prospects for intelligent civilizations to orbit around either. Red stars are so cold and so dim that a planet that could grow a civilization must orbit very closely to the red star, which would expose the planet to intense, deadly X-ray radiation. So, though red stars are the most numerous and appear to have many planets orbiting them, red stars are a no-go for hosting intelligent, civilized life like our own. That leaves the yellowish stars, about 10% of all stars. However, an important fact must be met before considering the possibility of intelligent life living around a yellowish star. That fact is that the yellow star must be a third-generation star. Only third-generation stars will contain sufficient chemical diversity to sustain advanced life forms. Each time a star explodes, heavier, more complicated elements are created. The explosion expelled these elements and eventually found their way into a nebula. Gravity within the nebula will gradually form the next generation of stars, and so on. Our bodies need calcium for our skeletons and teeth. Our brains need zinc to help create the electrochemical signals that make us move, feel, and think. Our blood needs iron. Therefore, our bodies need to have formed around a third-generation star, and a yellow one. Amazingly, Earth has all the different elements in the universe, all 94 naturally occurring ones, from hydrogen to plutonium. Maybe that's why we're here. And we have to thank our third-generation yellow dwarf sun for that. Why yellow? Because yellow stars burn very steadily by nuclear fusion, without significantly changing brightness over billions of years. If our sun became just 6% brighter or dimmer, Earth would become too hot or too cold to sustain civilized life. Fortunately, Earth is in the habitable zone around the sun. The habitable zone is where liquid water can exist on a planet. But that brings us to the second condition necessary for intelligent life to live in space the planet itself. Recent studies with the Kepler telescope have shown that one quarter of all yellow dwarf stars may contain Earth-like planets in the habitable zone around yellow dwarf stars. That figure is somewhat debatable. It might be as few as one out of every 33 yellow dwarf stars, but that's still a lot of planets orbiting yellow stars in habitable zones. So let's consider the second essential component for intelligent life in space, the planet itself. The planet that would bear intelligent civilization must have many particular characteristics that aren't easy to come by individually, and even more rare to find in combination. Most importantly, the planet must have protection against the star it's orbiting. Because stars shine by nuclear fusion in their cores, gas in the outer shell of the sun, called the corona, gets blown off into space in what's called the solar wind. Our United States satellites take constant readings of the force of the solar wind, which is mainly electrified, ionized, hydrogen nuclei, along with a smattering of atomic nuclei from the many other elements found in the sun. It's not the atmosphere that protects Earth, it's the magnetosphere that stops, or deflects, the dangerous solar wind, causing aurorae when the solar wind is attracted to Earth's magnetic poles and electrifies the air of the upper atmosphere like a fluorescent bulb. Without a magnetosphere surrounding it, any planet, even those in habitable zones, would be toasted by a constant rain of ionized hydrogen nuclei from its star. A planet with life on it must have a magnetosphere strong enough to deflect the solar wind. Not every planet in our solar system has a magnetosphere. 
The gas giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, have magnetospheres, but gas planets cannot have civilizations. Of the solid worlds, only Earth and Mercury have magnetospheres, and Mercury is too weak to stop the solar wind because of its closeness to the Sun. Another protective shield that keeps the Earth safe from the Sun is its atmosphere. The atmosphere is about 300 miles thick, with most of it concentrated within just 10 miles of the Earth's surface. The atmosphere protects life on Earth from both the Sun's ultraviolet, UV, radiation, and X-rays. The gas, ozone, which is three oxygen atoms bound into a large gas molecule in the upper atmosphere, blocks most of the Sun's UV radiation from reaching the ground. The planet Mars, whose atmosphere is 1,000 times thinner than the Earth's, has no ozone, and the Sun's ultraviolet emissions have totally irradiated its surface. A planet must be able to stop the UV radiation from its star. So the specific composition of the atmosphere is critical for any planet to have an intelligent civilization. We've got it, but it is a rare and precarious mix. The planet must have some part of its surface solid to walk and work on. The planet must have a crust. It's pure science fiction to consider underwater civilizations or floating civilizations in the atmospheres of other planets. A planet's crust must have tectonic plates that move. This movement of tectonic plates creates the subduction of the crust. Subduction is when one tectonic plate slides under or over another, bringing the fresh matter to the surface. This renewal of the chemical properties of the planet prevents chemical equilibrium, where nothing is reactive. Earthquakes and volcanoes also contribute to the process of geochemical renewal. That's right, earthquakes and volcanoes are good. Subduction of tectonic plates, then, is another planetary essential for life. Mars doesn't have tectonic plate activity. Neither does Venus nor Mercury. Mercury is one big tectonic plate, but there's no ongoing plate activity other than slight shrinkage. One big reason these planets have no life is that there's no geochemical reactivity because there's no tectonic subduction. And that brings us to the moon. Yes, the moon. To say that the moon keeps us alive may seem like a stretch, but the contribution of the moon to life on Earth is essential. First, the gravity of the moon as it moves through space with the Earth not only makes the ocean tides ebb and flow, it also helps the rotation of the Earth to churn or stir the magma inside the Earth. The motion of the magma inside the Earth, with its high metallic content, contributes to the creation of the Earth's magnetosphere. So, the moon keeps us safe in space by helping Earth become a geodynamo and creating our magnetism. The moon is the largest moon in the solar system compared to the size of the planet it orbits, essentially its primary. Many people consider the Earth-Moon system to be a double planet, but that's another issue. Another thing the moon does that keeps life safe on Earth is to hold the Earth steady. Because the moon is gravitationally locked to the Earth, the moon acts much like a balance pole does for a tightrope walker. Therefore, the Earth doesn't wobble very much compared to other planets. This wobble is called libration. If the Earth wobbled as much as Mars or Saturn, not only would our weather become chaotic, but farming might have been impossible. These rare or unique astronomical circumstances work together to make Earth habitable for humanity. Many other factors are not astronomical, such as evolutionary, biological, and chemical factors required for life to exist on Earth. The probabilities, or improbabilities, are multiplying. Taken all together, we are very, very lucky to be here. In fact, we're so lucky that we may have hit the jackpot. Considering all the possibilities, it's doubtful that anywhere else in the universe is as fortunate as Earth. Now, as a child, weren't you taught not to play with your food? Well, apparently, these astronauts weren't. Floating jello cubes across the cabin while in zero G is a lot of fun. But it is also a sign of a potential problem called space euphoria. No one ever considered that extreme happiness in space could become a severe problem. But it can become a serious problem, and that's no kidding. For many years, space euphoria went undetected, although it was right there, front and center, for all to see. When Apollo 14 astronaut Alan Shepard smuggled golf balls onto the moon and tried to create a tiny moon for the moon by attempting to hit a golf ball into orbit around the moon, everyone thought it was funny. 
Apollo 16 astronaut Charles Duke thought it would be funny if he tried to compete with the 1972 Olympic athletes back on Earth. He attempted to outjump the Olympic athletes to benefit from the 1 6 gravity on the moon. Duke jumped so high that he rotated onto his back and fell crashing onto the life support system in his backpack. It could have been a fatal fall if the bag had cracked. Duke's commander, John Young, said, That's not funny. And it sure wasn't. Yet, when Apollo 17 astronauts began dancing and singing children's nursery songs while collecting rock samples, everyone still thought it was cute. Space euphoria again went unnoticed. As early as 1965, when Ed White became the first American to walk in space on a tethered spacewalk, his space euphoria became evident. He stayed out much longer than was necessary to test his mobility with the very first jetpack, or MMU as it was called, officially the manned maneuvering unit. In his own words, I'm not coming back. This is fun. Finally, when ordered to return to his Gemini spacecraft, Ed White said it was the saddest day of my life. Obviously, something sinister is at work with space euphoria. Weightlessness, combined with the view of Earth passing below, creates an exhilaration that overcomes all sense of duty. It is the great danger of space euphoria. Now, in hindsight, the effects of space euphoria could be seen when Apollo 17 astronauts drove the lunar rover on the moon. They exceeded the recommended speed limit and could be heard whooping and yelling as the rover rocked onto two wheels, even becoming airborne at times. Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield was busy at work during his tethered EVA extravehicular activity when he paused to look over his shoulder. The glory of space smacked him in the face. He was so emotionally overwhelmed at the magnificent beauty of the Milky Way galaxy that tears began to fill up Hadfield's eyes. Now in space, tears do not flow down your cheeks. They pool up in your eyes. Hadfield had become blinded by tears of joy. But Hadfield, against protocol, refused to tell his supervisors on Earth. Only after he was no longer able to work did Hadfield speak a famous quote, Houston, I have a problem. It was a direct result of space euphoria. Astronaut Hadfield managed to get back into the space shuttle, but his EVA was not fulfilled. Space euphoria had interfered. There is another aspect of space euphoria that deserves serious attention. It is something called the overview effect. Weightlessness in space affects everything from the physical and psychological health of the astronauts to the physics of using all the mechanical equipment of the spacecraft. However, weightlessness in space is not due to a lack of gravity. Astronauts orbit Earth less than 300 miles up, called LEO, low Earth orbit. There's plenty of gravity in low Earth orbit. The Earth's gravity keeps the Moon in orbit, and the Moon is about 250,000 miles away. In fact, a 150-pound astronaut would weigh 142 pounds in LEO. Weightlessness in space is due to freefall, not lack of gravity. What goes up must come down. The rocket blasts off, and about 8 minutes later, the engine shut off. The spacecraft begins to fall back to Earth. Fortunately, by this time, the rocket has achieved orbital velocity, which is about 17,500 miles per hour. So that it falls towards Earth, but never hits the Earth. It keeps falling and falling around and around, precisely in the same curved path as the surface of the Earth. It's in orbit. It is freefall. Even though everyone calls it zero-g, it's not. If you were to place a bathroom scale under your feet when in freefall, it would show zero. You would weigh nothing. That's because the bathroom scale is falling too. The exciting thing is that astronauts retain all their muscle power, their mass stays the same. Therefore, they can lift heavy equipment in space that would weigh hundreds or even thousands of pounds on Earth. Astronauts become superhumans in space, and that creates another unusual situation. There are lots of unusual situations in space. On the very first trip to the moon, the Apollo 8 astronauts were not even scheduled to look back and photograph the Earth. Apollo 8 astronauts took only a limited number of pictures of Earth. That's unusual and kind of weird. But Earthrise from the Moon became perhaps the most influential environmentalist picture of the 20th century, and it wasn't even planned. But this is the key to understanding the overview effect – surprise at the unexpected. Even today, almost all globes of Earth are not of Earth. Globes in schools and libraries show each country, usually in different colors. 
Each country, sure enough, contains a star. But it is to mark the capital city of that country. It is not how the Earth looks from space. These globes are not globes of the planet Earth. In fact, it isn't easy to even find a globe of the planet Earth. Read the labels on these classroom globes. The geopolitical world. These are globes of a place called the world. There is no planet called the world. The world does not live in space. It lives on someone's desk or shelf. The definition of space is geological in origin. Space is defined as existing up to, but not including, the atmosphere of Earth. Earth isn't even an astronomical object. It explains why the very first mission to the Moon, the Apollo 8 mission, had not scheduled any pictures of Earth. Selfies weren't invented then. It also explains why the psychological impact of seeing Earth rise from the Moon was so profound. It was a unique and totally new perception for which any and all humans were utterly unprepared. Seeing Earth in space was a complete surprise. Imagine yourself floating in space outside the spacecraft. You are surrounded by the Milky Way galaxy blazing with millions of stars. The planet Earth is a blue marble passing beneath your feet. Pretty heady stuff. How would you react? Would it change you? Apollo 9 astronaut Rusty Schweiker felt strongly that he was what he called the sensing element for humanity. What does he mean? It's the overview effect kicking in. Schweiker felt that he was connected to all the people on Earth. He compared it to being born into a new existence. And astronaut Schweikert is not the only one who felt the overview effect. Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell had this to say about being in space. It was rather an extension of the same universal process that evolved our molecules. And what I felt was an extraordinary personal connectedness with it. I experienced what has been described as an ecstasy of unity. I not only saw the connectedness, I felt it and experienced it sentiently. I was overwhelmed with the sensation of physically and mentally extending out into the cosmos. Some years after returning from space, astronaut Mitchell started an institute to study the brainwaves of people who had been in space. And yes, they are different. According to Mitchell's institute's research, the euphoric sensation of oneness with the universe creates brainwaves similar to meditating monks. Mitchell's studies were so significant that NASA launched a special space shuttle mission in 1998 just to study the effects of space on the brain. The Neurolab mission studied brain cells of laboratory animals, and the astronaut crew too, as brain cells try to adapt to the freefall environment in low Earth orbit. Well, we can't all be astronauts, but now we can all access virtual reality experiences of what the astronauts saw in space. The internet has opened up our Earth-bound point of view to share the unity and oneness of the overview effect and give us a small taste of the space euphoria astronauts get in space. Imagine a basketball spinning on someone's finger. A point near the middle of the ball takes longer to spin back to where it started than the spot where your finger is. Earth spins in much the same way. People in the center of Africa are turning at 1,000 miles per hour as the planet rotates, while anyone at the South Pole doesn't really move at all, other than rotating in place. At the same time, we're all moving forward through space equally fast, since the planet is also hurtling around the sun at 67,000 miles per hour. The temperature at the boundary of our planet's inner and outer core is 10,800 degrees Fahrenheit. That's as hot as the surface of the sun. And the pressure there is 3.3 million times the atmospheric pressure at sea level. Two or three years ago, an asteroid was pulled into Earth's orbit and started to travel around the planet. Even though it's no larger than an average car, it's still a big deal. Out of more than one million asteroids astronomers know about, it's only the second one to orbit our planet. Called 2020 CD3, it's our temporary mini-moon. It won't be with Earth for long, though. The asteroid is following a random orbit and is slowly drifting away. Temporarily captured objects, such as 2020 CD3, are rare. They need to have a specific direction and speed to be caught by Earth's gravitational pull. Otherwise, they either crash into the planet or fly in another direction. The movement of galaxies and clusters billions of light years away from us suggests there's some enormously massive body outside the visible universe. After billions of years, 
the expansion of the universe will make the space so sparse that we won't be able to see the stars in the sky at all. The moon isn't a perfect sphere. It's shaped like an egg. Plus, the satellite's center of mass is a bit more than a mile off its geometric center. Even though Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system, it still has snow. But not what you'd expect. It snows metals and rains acid. (laughs) Not a great vacation spot. Saturn is mostly composed of hydrogen and helium, with some traces of methane, ammonia, and water. But it contains more sulfur than Jupiter, which gives the planet a smog-like orange hue. On Earth, sound waves make air molecules vibrate, which is why we're able to hear sound. Other planets and moons allow sound to travel through mediums like their atmospheres and oceans, too. In space, though, it's said that there is no sound, since there aren't any molecules to vibrate and deliver sound waves. However, not all researchers agree on this, given that space isn't just a desolate vacuum. In between the emptiness, there are clouds of gas and other stray particles. So, depending on where you are, sound waves can be possible. Astronomers know for sure that the universe is growing bigger, and the speed at which it's ballooning is increasing all the time. But if the whole thing is swelling into something bigger, then it must have some kind of an edge, right? It's unlikely that people will ever find out, but if so, then what would it be? A ginormous brick wall and then nothing? An abyss that leads to nowhere? The most common theory is that the universe is shaped in such a way that it can't have an edge. But it's not the only idea. Another theory is even more difficult to comprehend. The universe is, indeed, infinite. And our part of it isn't that unique. It means that somewhere out there, there's another you. Or rather, other you. One of them is just a bit shorter. Another wears their hair in a different way. And the third one is identical to you in all possible ways. There's also a theory about a multi-universe that consists of many smaller universes. And the universe we live in is just a tiny bubble among other similar bubbles. Those scientists who support this idea are also sure that bubble universes can come into contact with one another. Then gravity starts to flow between them. And when two or three universes connect, a big bang occurs. Just like the one that created our home universe. Neptune is the windiest place in the solar system. Clouds of frozen methane are whipped across the planet at a speed of 1,200 miles per hour. Neptune's core is solid and consists mostly of iron and some other metals. Its mass is 1.2 times bigger than that of Earth. The temperature inside reaches 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Astronomers also believe that at a depth of 4,500 miles, there might be a diamond layer where it's raining diamond crystals. On Earth, people are used to a beautiful sunset that's painted in hues of orange, red, and yellow. On Mars, however, the normally pinkish red sky turns blue as the sun goes down under the horizon. It's because Mars is much farther away from the sun than Earth, making the sunlight less intense. The fine dust in the Martian atmosphere absorbs the blue light and gets rid of the warmer colors that you typically see on Earth. Whether it's blue or yellow, both sunsets look spectacular. At around a quarter of the size of Earth, the moon is pretty enormous relative to other satellites out in space. There's nothing quite like this situation anywhere else in the solar system. Pluto has a moon that's almost half as big as itself, but it's more like a twin than a satellite. There are more than 150 moons in our solar system, and Earth's is the fifth largest out of the whole lot. There might be a labyrinth of lava tubes on the moon. Not long ago, astronomers received the results of an underground lunar topography. They discovered a massive cave under the satellite's surface. About 30 miles long and 60 miles wide, the cave's likely to be the result of 3 billion-year-old volcanic activity. After streams of lava hardened, they created a thick, hard crust on the outside. But inside, lava kept flowing, melting the rock, and forming tunnels and caves. Countless pits in the moon's surface discovered by NASA might be the openings to lava tubes. We can't dig up most of Earth's gold. 99% of it ended up in the center of the planet several billion years ago, attracted by the iron in Earth's core. 
We're talking about 1.6 quadrillion tons of gold here. That's enough to coat the entire planet's surface in 1.5 feet of the stuff. And if all those meteorites hadn't later smashed into the ground, bringing extra amounts of gold, it would be even rarer. Not so long ago, astronomers discovered a massive blob of some mysterious substance. It was hidden underneath the surface of the moon's far side. Its mass was the same as that of a pile of metal five times larger than the big island of Hawaii. The enigmatic something lies almost 200 miles beneath an enormous crater that appeared on the lunar surface billions of years ago. The blob likely has something to do with a super collision. It might be the metal core of the object that hit the moon back then. Scientists can't wait to lay their hands on the discovery. It could explain lots of things about the South Pole Aitken crater, the largest known in the solar system. If it was on Earth, its oval-shaped basin would stretch from Washington, D.C. to Texas. In 2011, astronomers discovered an enormous water reservoir simply floating in space around a supermassive black hole called a quasar. Floating water vapors have been found throughout the universe, but they aren't that common. This particular reservoir holds around 140 trillion times the amount of water in the Earth's oceans. It's one of the oldest, largest, and, at more than 12 billion light years away, one of the farthest things known to humankind. Astronauts in space can lose about 1% of their muscle mass each month. To prevent this, they have to stick to an exercise regimen that lasts two hours every single day. The Milky Way galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy are going to meet in 3.75 billion years. They're moving toward each other at a breakneck speed. When the two galaxies collide, they'll form a huge elliptical galaxy. I won't be around then. Have you ever looked up at the night sky and tried to count all the stars? Yeah, good luck. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, has about 100 billion stars. But other estimates put it at over 200 billion, since calculating the exact amount is an almost impossible task, even for astronomers. As for the entire universe, there are at least a billion trillion stars. That's one with 21 zeros after it. For comparison, that means there are more stars in space than there are grains of sand on all of the Earth's beaches. Venus most likely used to be covered with oceans, from 30 to 1,000 feet deep. Also, some water was locked in the soil of the planet. On top of that, Venus had stable temperatures of 68 to 122 degrees Fahrenheit, which, you have to admit, was quite pleasant and not that different from the temperatures on Earth nowadays. So, what I'm getting at is that for 3 billion years, right until something irrevocable happened 700 million years ago, Venus could have been habitable. But now, it's not. The Moon is the second brightest object in our sky. At the same time, among other astronomical bodies, it's one of the dimmest and least reflective. Our natural satellite only seems bright because it's so close to Earth. For comparison, our planet looks much brighter when you look at it from space. It's because clouds, ice, and snow reflect way more light than most types of rock. Triton, Neptune's moon, has all its surface covered with several layers of ice. If this satellite replaced our current moon, the night sky would get seven times brighter. Neutron stars are some of the smallest, yet most massive objects in space. They're usually about 12 miles in diameter, but are several times heavier than the sun. Oh, and they also spin about 600 times per second, far faster than your average figure skater. Saturn is the least dense planet in the solar system. It has one-eighth the average Earth's density. And still, because of its large volume, the planet is 95 times more massive than Earth. A transient lunar phenomenon is one of the most enigmatic things happening on the moon. It's a short-lived light, color, or some other change on the satellite surface. Most commonly, it's random flashes of light. Astronomers have been observing this phenomenon since the 1950s. They've noticed that the flashes occur randomly. Sometimes they can happen several times a week. After that, they disappear for several months. Some of them don't last longer than a couple of minutes. But there have been those that continued for hours. The year was 1969, one day before Apollo 11 landed on the moon. 
One of the mission participants noticed that one part of the lunar surface was more illuminated than the surrounding landscape. It looked as if that area had a kind of fluorescence to it. Unfortunately, it's still unclear if this phenomenon was connected with the mysterious lunar flashes. Trash isn't just a problem in Earth's oceans, cities, and forests. There is a thing called space junk, which is any human-made object that's been left in space and now serves no purpose. There's also natural debris from meteoroids and other cosmic objects. There are currently over 500,000 pieces of space debris orbiting the Earth at speeds high enough to cause significant damage if they were to collide with a spacecraft or satellite. NASA does its best to track every single object to ensure that missions outside Earth can reach their destination safely. Our Sun is insanely massive. What's a proof? 99.86% of all the mass in the solar system is the mass of the Sun. In particular, the hydrogen and helium it's made of. The remaining 0.14% is mostly the mass of the solar system's eight planets. The Sun's temperature is hotter than the surface of a star. The surface temperature reaches 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, but the upper atmosphere heats up to millions of degrees. If someone could dig a tunnel straight into the center of the planet and out the opposite side, and you were adventurous enough to jump into it, it would take you 42 minutes to fall to the other side. You'd speed up as you fell, reaching maximum speed by the time you reached Earth's core. After the halfway point, you would then fall upwards, getting slower and slower. By the time you reached the opposite surface, your speed would be back to zero. Unless you managed to climb out of the hole, you'd immediately start falling again, back down or up to the other side of the planet. This trip would go on forever, all thanks to the weird effects of gravity. Hey, might be a fun way to spend an afternoon. There might be more metals, for example, titanium or iron, in lunar craters than astronomers used to think. The main problem with this finding? It contradicts the main theory about how the Moon was formed. That theory says that Earth's natural satellite was spun off from our planet after a collision with a massive space object. But then, why does Earth's metal-poor crust have much less iron oxide than the Moon's? It might mean the Moon was formed from the material lying much deeper inside our planet. Or these metals could have appeared when the molten lunar surface was slowly cooling down. Or maybe, as they've been saying for centuries, it's made of green cheese. Earth could have been purple before it turned blue and green. One scientist has a theory that a substance existed in ancient microbes before chlorophyll, that thing that makes plants green, evolved on Earth. This substance reflected sunlight in red and violet colors, which combined to make purple. If true, the young Earth may have been teeming with strange purple-colored critters before all the green stuff appeared. The highest mountain in the solar system is Olympus Mons on Mars. It's three times as high as Mount Everest, the Earth's highest mountain above sea level. If you were standing on top of Olympus Mons, you wouldn't understand you were standing on a mountain. Its slopes would be hidden by the planet's curvature. Astronomers have found a massive reservoir of water in space, the largest ever detected. Too bad it's also the farthest, 12 billion light years away from us. The water vapor cloud holds 140 trillion times as much water as all the Earth's oceans combined. What are we supposed to do with that information? Venus spins at its own unhurried pace. A full rotation takes 243 Earth days, and it takes the planet a bit less than 225 Earth days to go all the way around the Sun. It means a day on Venus is longer than a year. There's very little seismic activity going on inside the Moon. Yet many moonquakes, caused by our planet's gravitational pull, sometimes happen several miles below the surface. After that, tiny cracks and fissures appear in the satellite surface, and gases escape through them. Hey, they sometimes escape from me, too. Now Mars is the last of the inner planets, which are also called terrestrial since they're made up of rocks and metals. The red planet has a core made mostly of iron, nickel, and sulfur is between 900 and 1,200 miles across. The core doesn't move. That's why Mars lacks a planet-wide magnetic field. The weak magnetic field it has is just 1 100th percent of the Earth's. When the planets in the solar system were just starting to form, 
Earth didn't have a moon for the longest time. It took a hundred million years for our natural satellite to appear. There are several theories as to how the moon came into existence, but the prevailing one is the fission theory. Somebody went fishing and caught the moon? Actually, no. The fission theory proposes that the moon was formed when an object collided with Earth, sending particles flying about. Gravity pulled the particles together, and the moon was created. It eventually settled down on the Earth's ecliptic plane, which is the path that the moon orbits. So, looks like the green cheese is off the table now. The largest single living thing on Earth turns out to be a mushroom in Oregon. This enormous honey mushroom lives in Malheur National Forest and covers an area of 3.7 square miles. It could be as much as 8,500 years old. You could be forgiven for missing it, though, since most of it's hidden underground. When the roots of individual honey mushrooms meet, they can fuse together to become a single fungus, which explains how this one got so big. If you could gather all that mushrooming stuff into one big ball, it could weigh as much as 35,000 tons. That's about as heavy as 200 gray whales. Hey, that's a whale of a mushroom. <laughs> the largest asteroid in the solar system is called Vesta, and it's so big that it's sometimes even called a dwarf planet. A trip to the nearest star apart from the sun would take you 5 million years on a commercial airplane. That's what I call a long haul flight. Space isn't supposed to be black. There are stars everywhere. Shouldn't they light up everything around? Well, you don't see stars wherever you look because some of them haven't existed long enough for their light to reach Earth. A day on Uranus lasts 17 hours, 14 minutes, and 24 seconds. But get this, the planet has a tilt of around 98 degrees, and that makes a season on the gas giant last 21 Earth years. Now, some scientists believe that our planet used to have an additional satellite. According to their research, a small celestial body about 750 miles wide orbited Earth like a second moon. It most likely crashed into our main satellite later on. Such a collision could explain why the two sides of the moon look so different from each other, one being heavily cratered and rough. Or it could be the green cheese. Venus has exceptionally high temperatures, hot enough to melt lead. It's the hottest planet in our solar system, with a high-pressure environment and super strong winds. The winds there are 50 times faster than the planet's rotation. It's getting stronger over time, and scientists don't know why. But they did find something interesting in the planet's clouds, a potential sign of decaying biological matter. Could there be life then? Not quite, since Venus has a dry, windy atmosphere and doesn't have enough water for life to develop. Rings around other planets are more common than we thought. Saturn's rings are the most famous and spectacular ones. They partially consist of reflective, sparkly water ice, and you can't see anything like that in the rest of our solar system. Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune have ring systems too. And those most likely consist of dust and rocky particles. And not just planets, astronomers found out rings were around one asteroid as well. Speaking of rings, why do you think that Earth doesn't have them? Gas giants have rings, while the rocky ones don't. Two theories explain how rings form. They could be the remains from the times when planets were forming. Or they could be leftover material of an impact that destroyed an unknown moon. Or gravity broke apart this moon of its parent planet. It's not clear why only the gas planets have rings. They formed in the outer area of our solar system, while rocky planets only in its inner circles. May be a good clue. Maybe these inner rocky planets had just better protection from strong impacts that could have formed rings. Also, there are more moons in the outer solar system. And there are more rings there. Another thing may be that bigger planets have a bigger volume, so a ring system can remain stable there. Some theories even say that Earth used to have a ring system. A long, long time ago, our planet collided with a Mars-sized object which most likely resulted in a dense ring of particles and debris. But our story was a bit different than the outer planets. And those rings probably combined and formed the moon. Do we know the shape of the universe? 
Einstein had a theory of general relativity. It said that the universe could be in one of these three forms, closed like a sphere, open like a saddle, or flat like a piece of paper. Its shape determines whether it's infinite or not, and whether it will expand forever or maybe collapse at some point. The shape of the universe depends on its density and rate of expansion. One of the best ways to determine its shape is to use something called the cosmic microwave background. It's the relic afterglow, something that's left of the Big Bang. Sound waves that were moving through the universe in its early stages produced quite small spatial variations in the temperature of its faint light. The result of these studies show that the universe probably expands in all directions, which means it's flat. How come our sun is hot while the moon is cold? The sun gives off heat because its core is extremely hot. In there, the pressure is pretty high. The hydrogen turns into helium. That's how the sun creates light and heat. The solar light and heat are enough to light up our days on Earth, as well as support life here, even though the sun is around 93 million miles away from us. The moon is not hot because it doesn't have an atmosphere, so it can't absorb sunlight as our planet does. Its surface gets very hot in the daytime, about 210 degrees Fahrenheit, but since there's no atmosphere, the temperature drops extremely during the night to negative 279 degrees Fahrenheit. The sun is hot, no doubt there, but the space around it is very cold. Heat is the energy objects store inside of it. Temperature is how we measure if something is hot or cold. So when you transfer heat to certain objects, its temperature goes up. Take it away, and the temperature goes down. You can transfer heat in three different ways. Convection, conduction, and radiation. Convection works within gases and liquids, and conduction is for solids. The temperature only affects matter. Space doesn't have enough particles. It's nearly a complete vacuum, which means transferring heat is not effective. The only way to do it is through radiation. When the heat coming from the sun falls on an object in the form of radiation, the atoms that make up that object will absorb energy. This energy moves the atoms and makes them produce heat throughout this process. In space, temperatures of the objects stay the same for a long time. Cold objects stay cold, and hot ones stay hot. If you place anything outside of the Earth's atmosphere and expose it to direct sunlight, the sun will heat it to about 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Objects in outer space that surround our planet and don't receive sunlight directly are at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature is like this because there are molecules that escape our atmosphere, so the sun heats them. We used to think that water was really rare in space, but now we know there's water ice across our entire solar system. For starters, you can usually find water on asteroids and comets. It's also in craters on Mercury and the Moon that are in permanent shadows. On Mars, you'd find ice at its poles, under the surface dust and in frost. It might not be enough to support human colonies up there, but it's still something. Some other bodies in our solar system also contain ice, like the dwarf planet Ceres and one of Saturn's moons. Europa, one of Jupiter's moons, could be one of the most likely candidates we know about that could contain life. It probably has an entire ocean under its frozen and cracked surface. It could have twice as much water as all oceans on our planet together. Titan, the biggest of Saturn's moons, also has a liquid cycle, but it's not water. Its cycle moves materials between the surface and the atmosphere. At first, it sounds like the water cycle we have on Earth. But immense lakes on Titan are filled with ethane and methane. There's a chance they're over a layer of water. Neptune is about 30 times as far from the Sun as we are. Of course, it gets significantly less light and heat than Earth, but it also radiates way more heat than it's generating. There are more things happening in its atmosphere, especially if you compare it to its neighbor, Uranus. Uranus is closer to the Sun, but it still radiates the same amount of heat as Neptune. The winds on Neptune are insanely strong, 1,500 miles per hour. No one still knows why. It could be a gravitational contraction, energy coming from its core, or the sun. I hope we'll eventually find out. K2 
can you imagine hot ice? It exists just 33 light years away from us on one exoplanet. This planet consists of different water elements and they form burning ice. The ice there is solid because of pressure, but the surface temperatures are extreme and go up to 570 degrees Fahrenheit. That's how the water stays super hot and comes off as steam. Picture putting ice in your coffee when you want to heat it up. When you stargaze, it's almost like you're looking into the past. Stars are really far away and it takes longer for their light to reach our planet. So it's possible some of them have already run out of fuel and aren't alive anymore. The pillars of creation are a good example. This is part of a region 7,000 light years away from us called the Eagle Nebula. These are clouds of gas and dust in the shape of pillars. Scientists first discovered it in 1995, but in reality, a supernova explosion destroyed these pillars that were at least 6,000 years ago. So, the 1995 image shows these pillars from 7,000 years ago. Mars has the biggest volcano in the solar system that we know of so far. It's bigger than the whole state of Hawaii and 100 times larger than the biggest volcano on Earth. The red planet seems so quiet, but once upon a time, large volcanoes dominated its surface. Volcanoes on the red planet can probably grow so big because gravity there is a lot weaker than down on Earth. Also, the crust on our planet is moving all the time, and the Martian crust probably stays still. It's normal for planets to be a bit tilted on the side. The Earth is tilted at a 23-degree angle. That's why we have seasons. It's summer when the part of the world where you are leans closer to the sun. It works the opposite way, too. It's winter when you lean away from it. But Uranus is tilted more than normal. It lies as a 98-degree angle, which has a huge effect on its seasons. Each season on Uranus takes 21 years to play out. Something to think about the next time we complain that winter lasts forever. Now, here on Earth, we measure distances in minutes and hours, maybe even days. It takes 10 minutes to walk to your best friend's house, or 15 minutes to drive to your favorite cafe. But in space, it's different. It's vast, which means we measure how long it takes to get to a certain point in years, or in most cases, light years. So, if you want to walk to the moon one day, that would take you 9 years to span the 239,000 miles. Perhaps you'd like to take a ride to the nearby star, Proxima Centauri. Maybe if you kept the pedal to the metal at a constant speed of 70 miles per hour, you'd get there in about 356 billion hours, or around 40 and a half million years. Trust me, after the first 20 million years, you'd be second-guessing yourself as to why go there in the first place. Now, Mars contains the biggest valley, Valles Marineris, we've discovered so far. It's a pretty impressive system of canyons, 2,500 miles long. It's five times longer than the Grand Canyon. Researchers first spotted it back in the 1970s. A bank of volcanoes located on the other side of the canyon ridge probably helped form this valley. We haven't discovered a planet completely made of diamonds yet, but on some planets, it actually rains diamonds. On Jupiter and Saturn, gas giants of our solar system, lightning storms turn abundant methane into soot which we also know as carbon. The soot falls and transforms into graphite. Further graphite transforms into diamonds with a diameter of about 0.4 inches. Now, before you start figuring out how to book a diamond-collecting field trip, know that these diamonds don't last. After they enter the planet's core, they melt. Ever notice how when you're stargazing two nights in a row in the same time, let's say 9 p.m., the stars stay in the same place, but the moon doesn't? Well, there are two reasons for that. First, it depends on what time you go stargazing. For instance, if you go outside at 8 p.m. and tomorrow you look for it at 11 p.m., you'll see the moon in two pretty different places. In this case, even the stars take different places in the sky since our planet is spinning. As you know, it takes 24 hours for it to make one full circle. That means, from our point of view, it seems like both the sky and everything up there is just moving around us one time per 24 hours. In the same way, the sun changes its position, rising and setting every day. So, if you went outside two nights in a row at the same hour, in most cases, you'll have to wait for an extra half hour or more until the moon gets back to the same position as the night before. 
the stars are pretty much standing still. It seems like they're moving, but that's because the Earth is spinning. But the Moon is actually moving around our planet and goes through different phases. For example, a new moon is when it's completely dark in the sky. A full moon is when its day side is facing the Earth. It takes approximately a month for it to finish one circle around the Earth. Maybe you'd be luckier on a diamond-collecting expedition on this next planet, 40 million light-years away from Earth. Scientists used to call it a super-Earth. Now, a super-Earth is generally a planet way bigger than ours. This planet, for example, is double the Earth's size. It's so close to its star that it makes a full circle around it in less than 18 hours, which means a year there is pretty short. Since it's so close to its star, its temperature goes up a whopping 4,900 degrees Fahrenheit. Because of the heat, in combination with the planet's density, scientists have the theory that its core is made of carbon in the form of graphite and diamonds. Over 10 years ago, astronomers discovered a huge water vapor cloud. It was 12 billion light years from our home planet. That cloud is the biggest source of water we know of. It's also the oldest, dating back to when the universe was only 1.6 billion years old. Now it's 13.8 billion years old. Man, if only I had started a savings account 12 billion years ago. With compound interest, I'd have me quite a pile of cash by now. But I wasn't around then. Anyway, this cloud is so large it holds 140 trillion times the amount of water in all the oceans on our planet. This cloud kind of feeds a black hole. It may also contain enough gases, such as carbon monoxide, to encourage the black hole to grow six times bigger than it is at the moment. The average temperature of our planet is about 57 degrees Fahrenheit. And the highest temperature ever measured was 134 degrees. Sound too hot? Well, on Venus, it can go up to 900 degrees, which makes it the hottest planet in our solar system. It's not hot enough to melt steel, though. It would need to be higher by 2,500 degrees to get there. But it's hot enough to melt lead, and it's way too hot to sustain life, at least not in any form that we know. Venus is not even the closest to the Sun, it's Mercury. But it has a super-thick atmosphere that traps greenhouse gases. It's like you covering yourself with a pretty thick blanket in the middle of the summer. Now, we're used to seeing volcanoes spewing hot molten lava. After all, that's what they mostly do on Earth. But in space, volcanoes tend to spew methane, water, or ammonia. And these materials freeze as they erupt and eventually transform into frozen vapor and something called volcanic snow. I'm talking about cryovolcanoes here. You can find them on Jupiter's moons Io and Europa, Saturn's moon Titan, and Pluto. These volcanoes are especially active on Io, which has hundreds of vents. NASA vehicles have even captured some of these erupting in real time. Plumes of frozen vapor coming out of them extended for about 250 miles. Hey, by the way, they just discovered another moon around Jupiter that might actually be good for farming someday. It's named (laughs) EIEIO. Now, what exactly happens to the light after it disappears inside of a black hole? Well, photon is a particle of light. The event horizon is the boundary of a black hole. When something, say a photon, crosses the line and enters those boundaries, it can't escape anymore. But it doesn't mean a black hole destroyed it. It pulls the photon in rapidly towards its center, where an enormous mass is packed into an infinitely small space. But we're not sure what happens to photons in such extreme conditions. It's still one of the biggest mysteries. Does a black hole destroy the light or not? Saturn has 82 moons we know about. 53 confirmed and 29 more that are still on the waiting list to be confirmed as actual moons before they get their official names. And one of the coolest moons might be a 914-mile-wide hunk of rock called Aepetus. It's dark on one side and bright on the other. Its lighter half is 20 times more reflective than the other one. As it turned out, the bright side is ice. The dark side is a bit more complicated. One theory says it's dark because of particles coming from another moon, the one named Phoebe. Another theory says it could be because of heat. Since the moon is rotating really slowly, its dark material is absorbing heat, which makes it even darker. Now, how big do you think a black hole can become? In theory, we can't find an upper limit to its mass. But astronomers believe the ultra-massive black holes, or UMBHs, located in the cores of certain galaxies are mostly up to 10 billion solar masses big. 
Recently, they even discovered these UMBHs physically can't grow much more than this because, in that case, they would start to disrupt the accretion disks that feed them. That way, they would kind of stuff the source of new material. Most people picture the universe as somewhere between aquamarine and pale turquoise. Even some researchers thought that was the case. They managed to determine the cosmic color by combining light from more than 200,000 galaxies within 2 billion light years of our planet. But the real color is actually closer to beige. Researchers got it all wrong because there was a bug in the software. No, really? <laughs> it converted the cosmic spectrum into the color our eyes would see if we were exposed to it. The team defined this color as a cosmic latte. Ooh, make that a double-shot low-fat large to go, please. There's a giant ghostly hand that stretches across space. Its eerie fingers are reaching for a glowing red cloud that looks like molten space lava. Although it looks like a scene straight out of a sci-fi movie, it's 100% real. The hand was formed after an enormous star collapsed in a huge supernova explosion. The boom created a new star that is bursting with energy. The energy given off by the star is so big that it caused debris from the explosion to swirl around it. This is what created the supernatural-looking hand. The hand is so big that it stretches a colossal 150 light years. As for the lava-like structure it's reaching for, that's actually a huge gas cloud. So while it looks spooky, it's completely harmless. And you can go to sleep tonight without worrying about a giant ghostly space hand scooping you out of bed. There's a bizarre star hidden in the depths of space that seems to randomly flash on and off. It's known as Tabby's star, and its light dims at super irregular intervals for really odd lengths of time. There have been so many theories about what's causing this, from meteor showers to outer space interference. The comet shower idea was quickly debunked. Dust from comets, which would block the light, goes away after a couple of months. Tabby's star fades slowly over decades, so the timing just doesn't add up. It can't be down to planets either, as no planet is big enough to block that much light from a star. After years of speculation, scientists have finally found an explanation for the strange phenomenon. The dimming and brightening are actually a result of space dust. A ring of dust surrounds the star, which often temporarily blocks its light. On day 8 of its mission in 2019, China's lunar rover discovered something really strange on the far side of our moon that caught the attention of the entire world. While navigating a path around a bunch of lunar craters, it spotted something really weird lurking inside one of the moon's holes. It was a colored substance, just like gel, that we'd never encountered before. The curious material was a rich dark green color and glistened like diamonds. After a year of analyzing the foreign substance that measured 20 inches by 6 inches, the scientists finally came to a conclusion. The glistening effect seems to come from glass. In space, it usually appears as a result of lunar impact melts. This means that it's most likely from a comet or rock that has hit the moon and melted upon impact. But while it's likely that the strange substance is just melted rock, scientists aren't 100% sure. This is because the pictures were captured under bad lighting conditions, and there were a bunch of other factors that badly impacted the quality of the images. So, the jury is still out on this one. There's a huge space cucumber floating through the galaxy, and no one really knows where it came from or why it's there. Okay, it's not exactly a cucumber. Or a pickle. It's more likely a super elongated rock. Scientists think it may be longer than half a mile, but only 540 feet wide. It's traveling so quickly that there's no way it's bound by our sun's gravity, meaning that the strange object was formed somewhere outside of our solar system. We don't even know how long it's been wandering through space. It's estimated that it entered our solar system during the Victorian era, but who knows where it had traveled before then. For years, we've been told there are eight planets in our solar system. Nine, if you count Pluto, which got kicked out of the club some years ago. But that might all be about to change. There may be an enormous secret world lurking in the midst of our system, which scientists are calling Planet Nine. This undiscovered planet could be way out past Neptune. There are seemingly unexplained clusters of orbits there, and this hidden ninth planet would explain this. The planet, if it exists, 
would be 10 times the size of Earth, take at least 10,000 years to orbit the Sun, and would sit over 200 times further out than our home planet. This is why it's been so tricky to identify, as it's almost impossible to take a picture of. In 2019, 30% of the area that the planet is likely to be in had been searched. It will take at least another two years to cover the remaining area. In the meantime, we'll be waiting on the edge of our seats. Mm, no. Strange radio waves are beaming down on Earth, and scientists are baffled. These fast radio bursts are sudden, unexplained, and last just milliseconds. We first picked up the weird signals in 2007, and scientists have been scratching their heads ever since. They appear to be coming from outside the Milky Way, millions of light years away. For us to pick them up from that far away, they must be emitting more energy in a fraction of a second than the Sun does in 80 years. Most of these signals only came once, which would have made identifying them much easier, until this all changed in 2017. In August, a signal was picked up that repeated 93 times, ruling out speculation that the signals were being caused by random one-off events. To this day, we still don't know what's causing the signals. Back in 2014, NASA captured a surprising picture of the sun that showed that it might like to play dress-up. A brilliant storm of magnetic fields caused the sun to look like a flaming jack-o'-lantern. Even weirder is that the image was captured on October 8th. It was possible because of something called active regions. These are basically areas of the sun that have greater levels of light and energy. This is what gives the flaming look in the images. The light forms two eyes, a nose, and a wide, jagged, smiling mouth. Fortunately, this look was just a coincidence, and there isn't a giant pumpkin-carving enthusiast lurking in the depths of space. Hey, I want to know, is this a trick or treat? Space fans spotted what appeared to look like a spoon on the surface of Mars. It was half covered in dust. They noticed it after images from a Mars rover had been released. As spooky as the suspicious silverware may sound, it was just a trick of the light. The spoon is just a regular old rock, albeit in a slightly odd shape. The play of shadows in the photo made the object look even more spoon-like. Maybe there's a dish nearby that the spoon ran away with. A cosmic eyeball floating somewhere among the stars is no regular-sized eye. It measures an incredible 660 miles across. One of Saturn's moons, Tethys, has become a bit of a celeb to space fans. The spherical moon sports a large crater that makes it look exactly like a giant interplanetary eyeball. There's even a set of peaks inside the crater that look like an iris. Saturn has a gang of 60 moons in total, and Tethys isn't the only one that looks like a random Earth object. Prometheus looks like a potato, Atlas resembles a pita bread freshly served from a Greek restaurant, and Mimas even looks like some villain spacecraft. And then there's this. There's a giant cat's eye right in the middle of space. Its official name is NGC 6543, but that's kind of long and boring, so most people call it the Cat's Eye Nebula. And it's actually one of the first nebulas to have ever been discovered. Like other nebulas, it was formed by a star that shed its outer layer of gas. The gas floated off and produced this amazing and intriguing structure. The star fires off this layer of gas every 1,500 years. Each time it does this, it creates a spectacular new dust shell. Hey, don't get me started on gas. Another rocket blasts off from the launch pad and heads for the International Space Station. To deliver the payload there, you'd have to pay about $18,000 per one pound of its weight. Imagine spending that much money on just three bananas. So the weight of the rocket and spaceship itself is calculated literally down to every bolt and every ounce. But engineers normally use about 600 pounds of white paint to coat the rocket. That's $10,800,000. Hmm, let's see. You could buy a three-masted schooner, a gold-plated Bugatti Veyron, or a penthouse in Manhattan, maybe two of them, for this money. Or perhaps even a private island. Well, a small one. But engineers have to paint rockets white so that they don't turn into flying ovens. Imagine sitting in a black car in a parking lot at noon in the summer. The air conditioning is off. You'll start feeling uncomfortable in a couple of minutes. But if your car is white, it will heat up more slowly. 
It's all about the reflectivity of the material. When the sun's rays touch a black surface, they get absorbed. As a result, everything under the surface heats up. But when the rays reach a white surface, they get reflected. This surface absorbs much less heat. That's why you feel much hotter wearing a black t-shirt in the summer than while putting on a white one. You also look hotter. (laughs) But I digress. Spaceships fly in space, and the temperature there is about minus 455 degrees Fahrenheit. Hmm. But space is also a vacuum. That means there's no air particles that can transfer heat up there. So nothing blocks the sun's rays and prevents them from heating up the surface of the rocket to insane temperatures. If the rocket was black, it would absorb all those rays, and astronauts would feel like a chicken in an oven. Besides heat, the sun emits radiation. Earth's magnetic field and atmosphere protect us from its destructive effect. But there's no such shield in space. So the white paint on the surface of spacecraft also protects astronauts from radiation. Spacesuits are white for the same reason. So is the International Space Station itself. On Earth, most airplanes are painted white. But even with white paint on the paneling, a spacecraft can heat up too much. And its other side, where the sun's rays don't reach, will cool down a lot. After all, space is very cold. So, engineers came up with a clever way to transfer the heat from the sunny side of the spaceship to its dark side. There are tubes under the paneling. They're filled with ammonia. The ammonia evaporates after absorbing the heat from the surface. Then it transports this heat to the colder side of the spaceship. There, it gives off the heat and returns to its liquid form. After that, the ammonia moves back to the illuminated side of the spacecraft. The second reason why we paint spacecraft white is that space is black. And if you paint your spaceship black or any other color, you won't be able to see it. This will make it difficult to dock spaceships with each other or with the ISS. But a white spaceship is perfectly visible against the black background of space. The third reason is that you can see even the slightest damage on the spaceship if it's painted white. Long before launch, the spaceship is assembled in a hangar from dozens of different parts. Then it's delivered to the launch pad. And if something went wrong in that process, you will see any scratch or crack on the white surface. Or if any part is leaking, you'll quickly notice a stain on the white surface. But it's not just the surface of spaceships and the ISS that gets painted white. The interior is white, too. If you look at photos of astronauts on the International Space Station, you'll see that most of the interior is either white or beige. Again, it's all about the reflectivity of this color. Electrical power is an important resource on the ISS. Every light bulb and LED must be used economically. And white surfaces effectively reflect the light from the bulbs all over the station. This way, it isn't dark there even without a lot of lighting devices. And this is the Saturn V, America's moon rocket from the 70s. It's the biggest, most powerful, and heaviest payload-carrying rocket ever made. And it's not completely white. Even more interestingly, its white parts are painted this way to provide protection from the scorching Florida sun on the launch pad. But you can also see black stripes all over the rocket's body. Thanks to them, cameras on the ground can determine its rotation speed. The point is that at launch, a rocket spins exactly like an arrow fired from a bow. This helps it to be more stable during the flight. When the rocket is launched and starts spinning, all video cameras are pointed at it. When experts watch the video of the launch, they analyze every frame. They pay attention to how the black stripes move. This way, they can calculate the rotation speed of the rocket. Now, let's take a look at the space shuttle. You can always recognize it by the huge orange tank attached to the spacecraft. It contained liquid oxygen and hydrogen to propel the space shuttle into orbit. And it was orange because it's covered with insulating foam. Oxygen and hydrogen can only be in a liquid state at extremely low temperatures and under high pressure. So engineers tried to protect the fuel from overheating with this insulation. But originally, this tank was white too. The reason was the same, to reflect the sun's rays. But later, engineers decided that the foam insulation would be enough and the paint layer was removed. So they managed to save about 600 pounds of weight and deliver more payload into space. And 600 pounds is almost 72 gallons of water or 900 large burgers. Wow, how did that get on board? Interestingly, the space shuttle itself wasn't completely white. It had a black bottom. That's to withstand the extreme heat of re-entering Earth's atmosphere. 
When the space shuttle completed its mission in space, it started to descend. At the height of, let's say, about 400,000 feet, it traveled at 25 times the speed of sound. When the space shuttle re-entered the atmosphere, it literally collided with air particles and began to break. At this point, its bottom heated up due to friction with the air. Try rubbing your palms together, they become warmer. The same happened to the bottom of the space shuttle, only it heats up to 2300 degrees Fahrenheit. By comparison, the temperature of a hot frying pan is about 6 times lower. Just touch it and see. Nah, don't. That's why engineers had to protect the bottom of the space shuttle from overheating with special black tiles. They're called HRSI, which stands for High Temperature Reusable Surface Insulation. Catchy. They're made of porous silicon, which means they're very light but can withstand extreme temperatures. But when it comes to new rockets, we won't have to worry about painting them white or protecting them with tiles. We'll build new rockets and spacecraft with stainless steel because it's easier, cheaper, and faster. Take the SpaceX Starship. This thing will be able to take people to the moon and, in the future, even to Mars. And it's made of stainless steel. Two pounds of carbon fiber, which is used in conventional spacecraft, cost about $200. But the same amount of stainless steel costs about 3 bucks. And since the weight of the spacecraft and booster is about 300 tons, the difference is huge. Stainless steel does a good job of reflecting the sun's rays, too. Even though it's dark, it's shiny, so the ship won't overheat. In addition, stainless steel is great at withstanding low temperatures, so it won't deform in cold space. And to save Starship from overheating on re-entry, its paneling is designed like a sandwich. There's an outer layer of steel, then a layer of air, and an inner layer of steel. Kind of like an Oreo. The air acts as thermal insulation. So, Starship with people on board is attached to the booster on the launch pad. Ignition. The booster helps Starship escape Earth's gravity, then it undocks. At that point, Starship fires its engines and enters orbit. By this time, it has used up almost all its fuel. Meanwhile, the booster re-enters the atmosphere and makes a soft landing. It docks with a refueling ship. Ignition. The booster launches again, takes the spacecraft into orbit, and returns to Earth. The refueling ship docks with the Starship and replenishes its fuel supply. It also transfers cargo to Starship. Then it undocks and returns to Earth for its next mission. At the same time, Starship turns on its space travel engines and heads for its destination. The journey to Mars will take about 7 months. SpaceX also plans to use Starship for traveling on Earth. Launches can take place from water platforms near big cities. Then, the trip to the other side of our planet will take no more than one hour. It's probably one of the worst nightmares for an astronaut to float away to outer space without any hope to return. Just imagine slowly moving away from the International Space Station into an endless black void because of some accident. Somewhere where there's absolutely nothing but a cold vacuum. Fortunately, you still have an opportunity to survive. Let's have a detailed look at the moment when this can happen. So, you're on the International Space Station. It's now at an altitude of about 250 miles in the upper layers of the atmosphere. It's important to mention that it's not just hanging out there in space. Earth's gravity is constantly pulling on the station, not to fall. The station needs to fly around our planet at a speed of about 17,000 miles per hour. That speed is fast enough to help the station fight the planet's pull. But on the ISS, when you go into outer space, you don't feel this speed. It seems to you that you're floating in one place, watching Earth spin. But there's still a lot of space debris that moves in the opposite direction. From the point of view of a person on the ISS, the speed of these objects is incredibly fast. You put on a spacesuit. It has oxygen supplies and is equipped with a water compartment so you can drink during the mission. So, you're about to walk into space. First, you need to go through a special door called an airlock. Once you're inside, you see that there are two doors here. You enter and close the first door to block access to the space station's oxygen. Then you open the door leading to space. What you're about to do is called a spacewalk. There are several reasons why you might be in outer space right now. You may be conducting scientific experiments to find out how different things behave in space. Also, you can be testing new equipment, sensors, and other high-tech gizmos. Another reason might be the repair of failed parts or routine maintenance of the International Space Station. 
Before taking a step into the void, you attach your spacesuit to a rope connected to the body of the ship. You can also fasten small cables to your tools, such as a screwdriver or a wrench, so that you don't lose them. You push off the ship and experience a feeling similar to swimming underwater. By the way, before going out into a zero-gravity area, astronauts train inside a huge swimming pool. You hold on to the parts of the ship and head to the place that needs to be repaired. Let's say you need to tighten a small screw. One astronaut once said that any work in outer space is difficult. You're wearing a huge suit that slows down your movements and makes you clumsy. It also makes your skin itchy. The work can last up to several hours. During this time, you sweat a lot. One of the spacesuit filters may be broken. In this case, all the fluid released by your body can spread all over the suit and reach your face. Your eyes may start watering. Tears will make your vision blurry. As you see, dozens of dangers are lurking out there in open space, and there are no clear instructions on how to deal with most of them. Anyway, you're tightening the screw, but something goes wrong. The wrench jumps out of your hand, and the screw flies out of the hull of the huh. ship. You try to catch it and accidentally push off the station. You manage to grab the screw, but your body is already flying away. You have nothing to hold on to, but you have the rope. And oh no, <gasps> it's not tied to your spacesuit anymore. You've attached it incorrectly. Now you're not just flying away from the station. Your body is also spinning. The views of blue earth and black space switch in front of your eyes. You can't stop. Fortunately, the cable is not the only safety measure. Your spacesuit is equipped with a safer. Simplified aid for EVA rescue. This is a backpack with fuel that works like a jetpack. You activate the backpack and it levels your flight. You stop spinning and calm down a bit. Now, you know exactly where the ISS is located. Next, you have to choose the direction manually and fly up to the station very carefully. The safer releases gas from small tubes, and this makes you fly forward. Using the safer control panel that looks similar to a joystick, you can change the direction in which the gas is released. This way, you'll steer your spacesuit. Make sure the station is in your line of sight. Press the joystick to activate the tubes, but take your time. You have to stabilize your forward movement. Pressing the wrong button can cause you to spin again, and this will reduce your chances of returning. Each astronaut spends many hours in a virtual reality simulator that makes them feel like being in outer space. So know how to control the safer. You're approaching the station at a slow pace. Don't let the backpack speed you up. If you start to accelerate, you need to point the tubes in the opposite direction to slow yourself down. If you fly too fast, you can crash into the station and damage the spacesuit. You've finally arrived at the ISS. You need to cling to something and move toward the airlock. You feel as if you're climbing a mountain underwater. You get to the airlock. Phew! Well, let's go back in time to the moment when you were flying away from the ISS. So, you tried to use the backpack to level your movement. You're nervous and can't calm down. You randomly press the joystick and chaotically direct the tubes in different directions. A few minutes pass. You haven't come closer to the station and the fuel in the safer has run out. Now, you're even more nervous. Let's go back in time again. You float away from the ISS, then use the safer and slow down the rotation speed of your body. Now you're facing the ISS. You approach the station with slow but steady thrusts. Everything is going well, but at one moment, you notice some movement. This is a small piece of metal from an old satellite. It crashes into the safer and slices through the backpack. Fuel starts leaking out into space. You start spinning again because of the impact. You don't understand which way you are moving. All you need now is to take a deep breath and use the remaining fuel to stop. Done. You're floating without rotating. There are no instructions and protocols that will help you get out of this situation. You're moving in outer space and can control this process. To return to the ISS, you need to push off something. Fortunately, you have time to think about what to do next. Your spacesuit has oxygen reserves that are enough for several hours. Also, you have water. You can drink it through a small rubber straw attached to the inside of your helmet neck ring. You're the first human in history who got into such a situation. But this doesn't mean there's no chance of survival. If you could throw something to the side, it set you in motion. For example, if you had a heavy wrench, you could throw it in the opposite direction from the ISS. This way, you'd launch yourself toward the station but unfortunately, you have nothing to throw. You have your broken safer, but you can't remove it without another person's assistance. 
You enjoy the beautiful view of Earth and try to breathe as slowly as possible to save oxygen. It seems there's no chance left for you. But at this moment, other astronauts call you using the radio. They see your location and are going to save you. Your colleague is heading in your direction. She's attached securely to two long cables. She's going to give you one of them when she reaches you. Using the safer, the astronaut flies in your direction. She's very close. Finally, she slows down and grabs your hand. She unhooks one of the cables from her spacesuit and attaches it to yours. Using the cable, you approach the station. At this moment, a rusty bolt flies by. The main danger is that space debris can break through your spacesuit and tear the rope. You accelerate and reach the airlock. And then, you open the door and dive inside. One of the most dangerous space missions has been completed. Theoretically, there's another way to save you. A spacecraft delivering food and air supplies to the ISS can pick you up and bring you back to the station. But this mission is even more difficult, as it requires a very precise route calculation. If something goes wrong, the spaceship can kick you. In this case, you will fly away at high speed. You can travel for several hours until you run out of oxygen, or a piece of space debris destroys your spacesuit. Fortunately, all astronauts are well-trained and experienced enough to avoid such accidents. Hello, Brightsiders. Today, we have a very unusual topic. We are discussing toilets in space. Do you know that the first astronauts didn't have a toilet at all? The first American astronaut and the second man in space, Alan Shepard, found himself in a very awkward situation. His flight was only supposed to last 15 minutes, so the engineers didn't install any toilet inside his spacecraft. Shepard took his seat in the spaceship about an hour before the scheduled launch. But due to weather conditions and technical problems, the rocket launch was delayed by two hours. Alan Shepard was lying on his back in the spaceship all this time. At one point, he felt the need to go number one. He reported it to ground control, but if Alan Shepard got out of the rocket to do his business, it would delay the rocket launch indefinitely. So, ground control didn't let him out of the rocket. The only option for him was to try and relax. In the end, he did his business right inside his suit. It's a good thing his spacesuit and the clothes underneath were made of cotton, which is quite absorbent and soaked up all the liquid. So Alan Shepard completed his flight in comfort and relatively dry. Though he still needed to turn off the sensors in his suit because if they got wet they could cause a short circuit. But the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin, managed to solve the same problem before the rocket was launched. When he was transported to the rocket by bus, a couple of minutes before they arrived at the rocket, he asked for a stop and relieved himself. This way, Yuri Gagarin made his nearly two hour flight in comfort. So remember, always go to the restroom before a long trip. Later, NASA took care of astronauts' call of nature using the following device, as they sent people into space on more extended missions. It consisted of a cylinder that an astronaut had to put on. Astronauts placed this system on straps near their waists. This cylinder was connected to a bag that collected all the waste. That was the first NASA toilet. Comfortable and cheap. NASA also tried to experiment with astronauts' diets. It was all about slowing down the digestive process and prolonging the time between eating food and drinking water to produce waste. One of the astronauts, John Glenn, tried this method out. His flight around Earth lasted about five hours. A special diet and medication allowed the astronaut to avoid the call of nature for a relatively long time. He did his business right before re-entering the atmosphere. 
When scientists analyzed his waist, they found out that its volume was 35% more than the average person's bladder could hold at maximum capacity. But the astronaut had no complaints about his condition and he said the flight had been quite comfortable. I know that now when astronauts spend time inside a space station or a spacecraft in outer space, they sometimes wear their spacesuits for up to nine hours. It means that using the regular toilet on board isn't really an option. The solution to this problem is simple. Diapers. They're more advanced than the ones sold on Earth, of course, with a special absorbent sewn into the fabric. It can keep an astronaut's body dry for a long time. As you already know, I'm a high school teacher. If we went with my students on a school excursion to the International Space Station, the first question they would ask would probably be, Tom, where's the restroom? Well, of course, they would be also excited to learn about the cosmos, but it turns out that using a restroom in zero gravity might be quite a challenge for which one needs to be prepared. If you take a hose in your backyard and start watering your flowers, the water comes out in a solid stream. The gravity captures it and falls where you aim. And in space, as you know, there's almost no gravity. So the water that comes out of the hose keeps flying in the same direction. And if you have to hit a precise target, it's even more difficult. The stream can break into droplets. They will start bouncing off the walls, going down and flying up. So if you're trying to use a regular toilet in space, you would be surrounded by flying droplets. The solution to this problem is to create a force that will attract the waste. If not gravity, then vacuum. Like the one we have in airplane toilets. After pressing the flush button there, you always hear a humming sound. That's the fan that starts pumping the air out of the waste tank. When the pressure is low enough, the hole in the drain opens and all the waste is instantly pulled down. And this is how the space toilet works at the International Space Station, where you have to create such vacuum from the very beginning. This way, the hose water will form a stream, not because of gravity, but the air pulled inside by a fan. Oh, and Regular toilets won't do. If you need to use the bathroom on the ISS, you need to take a hose and turn the toilet on with a button. The fan inside will start spinning, pulling in the air. You'll do your business essentially into a vacuum cleaner. There's a unique funnel shaped hose end so that both men and women can use the toilet. A suction air stream picks up all the droplets and directs them into the tank. Then comes the whole waste cleaning system with many filters and chemicals. There's also a tank of powerful acid. It's there to dissolve any solid formations in the waste. Otherwise, they can clog the filters and valves and complex systems and cause a breakdown. A leaky toilet is a very unpleasant thing when you're locked in a tight space without gravity. That acid can easily dissolve even some metals. That's why space toilet materials are made of special titanium alloys, super resistant and very expensive. After being cleaned, the waste gets turned into drinking water. It means that with time, you'll turn it into the garbage again and the cycle will repeat and repeat all over. Don't worry, the purification system works exceptionally well, so there's no harm in drinking the water. And your coffee also won't taste any worse. Things are a little more complicated if you run to the toilet for number two. Then, just like on Earth, you'll have to lift the toilet lid first. At this point, the same fan as in the previous case turns on. It should already be working to prevent bad smells. Then it would help if you sat on the toilet. And here's another challenge. It's hard to do it in zero gravity. So there are straps for your feet and handles to hold on to. The fan does a job and your business goes into the waste tank. Paper and tissues go in there too. Each portion of solid waste then goes into a bag and gets sealed. 
And then the system sends these waste bags to a special canister. These canisters are stored on the ISS until a cargo spacecraft arrives there. The astronauts receive food and water supplies and scientific equipment. Then they load the cargo spacecraft with canisters of human waste and other garbage. After that, it undocks and prepares to return to Earth. But since cargo spaceships burn up entirely due to friction against the air in the upper atmosphere, all the waste gets disposed of before reaching the planet's surface. Another option astronauts have is to throw the canisters with waste directly into the open space. Earth's gravity eventually attracts the containers and they too burn up in the atmosphere. Currently, NASA is developing a system that could recycle waste of number two into water. After all, water is a precious resource on the International Space Station. So this space toilet, which is a little thing about the size of a scooter, costs around $23 million. That includes manufacturing and a dozen years of development. And this price doesn't even include the delivery to the International Space Station. For that money, you could buy a Bugatti Veyron, the most expensive car in the world, or something similar. Or a private jet, for example. Or you can become an island owner. You can even buy a few of them for that money. But okay, let's get back to space. The journey starts at the launch pad. The rocket that will later deliver the cargo to the ISS is assembled. Ignition! The rocket engines turn on. They burn hundreds of pounds of fuel every second. The rocket goes up. And when all the fuel is burned, the rocket's first stage undocks. It returns to Earth and makes a soft landing. The booster can be used again after refueling. Once the booster is undocked, the rocket's second stage fires the engines. More fuel is burned so that the rocket can reach the ISS altitude of about 250 miles above the sea level. Once in orbit, the cargo spacecraft docks with the ISS. And voila! The space toilet is delivered. But it costs about 50 million to launch a booster rocket like Falcon 9. We also plan to send people to Mars and the trip will take them about 7 months. So we should create a comfortable bathroom for the astronauts, probably. <laughs> the design of the 23 million toilets is bound to be improved. Let's wish the engineers to make it smaller and lighter, so this way it uses less space and saves more fuel. Thank you for watching today, Brightsiders. And remember, let's learn something new every day together with Brightside. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends.